thank you for having me here today and uh, Greg Peterson um, we are I, uh, I'll go ahead and move to my there's Greg's <laughs> hey, you're right. no, you're not. Uh, I've known Greg for a long time and uh, uh, I really have a lot of respect for you Greg and um, uh, Greg as I think a lot of you probably know Greg he's a Gunnison rancher and a uh, just leader in many ways throughout the community and has been just one of the most engaged stakeholders in uh, the Gunnison sage grouse process as well as a lot of other things. So um, I've never had a chance to do a presentation with Greg, so this is a great honor for me and so this is great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about cheatgrass for about 10 minutes and then I'm going to turn it over to Greg and he's going to um, give his perspectives on cheatgrass as well. So. Uh, another person, uh, the previous slide told you about me a little bit more. I'm maybe wearing three hats today. I'm a, a faculty member at Western um, Colorado University, wildlife biologist. I'm also uh, the founder and director of the organization called Siskity, which is a Gunnison sage grouse nonprofit. And uh, then um, I'm also involved with this organization called the uh, Gunnison Basin sagebrush ecosystem alliance the gbc and jessica young back here is also uh, in, uh, engaged with that organization but we're trying to especially address the issue of cheatgrass in the basin um, another person that i really admire is uh <laughs> captain kirk and uh some of you might have heard that captain kirk went to space uh this week and um really he really went to space this time and uh he's 90 years old but um, I love this quote as he was going through. He says, this air which is keeping us alive is thinner than your skin. It's a sliver. It's immeasurably small when you think in terms of the universe. And there's so much about the fragility of this planet and especially of this place, um, the Sagebrush Sea, which uh, is really the, the uh, stage on which you know, we all live here in the Gunnison Basin where uh, the, the range is, where the, uh, you know, all the processes, the ecosystem processes are happening with energy flow and the, the biogeochemical cycles and uh, the, the habitat and the home of all the wildlife. So this place has to be intact and vibrant and able to function well for all of us to survive and to, to do well and to thrive. And unfortunately, some species aren't doing so well. This is a, a population graph showing what's gone on with the Gunnison sage grouse over the last 25 years. And, you know, one of the things to notice is that when you start over here on the very left side, we're in 1998 on this graph, and we have about 4,000 birds. This is the global population of Gunnison sage grouse. And it's only found in one little spot on the planet, which is right here. About 80, 85 to 87% of the birds are in the Gunnison Basin. So a huge responsibility we have here for uh, the fate and survival and so on of this species. You can see it's gone up and down a little bit over these last 25 years. We're kind of at the lowest place we've been uh, uh, in this time period, you know, down to, this is again the global population, 2,700 uh, individuals uh, that are alive on the planet. And so it's kind of alarming, I would say, to say it. Uh, it's that thin, thin skin, right? Um, but it's not just Gunnison sage grouse. There's a lot of other things that are out here. A lot of other sagebrush obligate bird species, um, as well as big game. And of course, this is the place where uh, all the, the rangelands are and the productivity and ability to sustain uh, cattle grazing and uh, the livestock um, lifestyle and so on is, is based on this place as well. So um, there's a, a there's lots of threats, there's lots of things to discuss, but the one that we're here to focus on today is this one, and one of the big and, and increasing threats to the sagebrush sea and all these species and to livelihoods and so on, recreation as well, is this thing, which is uh, cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum. And I'm just gonna show you a few slides to show uh, some of the places around the Gunnison Basin where we're seeing infestations and invasions of cheatgrass and the spread of cheatgrass, this is one going up toward uh, Crested Butte, uh, going just south of Almont on the west side, uh, 135. You can see much of that hillside now is just covered with cheatgrass. This is a common scene across the uh, Gunnison Basin now. Um, here's up above the Roaring Judy fish hatchery. 
Um, much of that hillside is totally dominated by cheatgrass now. Um, here's one going up Rainbow Lake Road. And one of the alarming things about this one is that you see these little patches along the side of the road. It's not consistent, but there's patches. But they go up almost seven miles now up Rainbow Lake Road. So this is really increasing in elevation, getting higher and higher up. And then here's one of the biggest patches that we have, which is just almost this entire hillside over by Dillon Pinnacles, completely covered with cheatgrass. You can see a couple little wildflowers in there, but otherwise it's a monoculture of cheatgrass. So the point I'm trying to make with these slides is a few things that uh, we do have cheatgrass in the Gunnison Basin. Um, 20 years ago, people didn't think it would ever be a problem here. There was a lot of resistance to doing anything about cheatgrass. Uh, I think we're realizing that the time is different now. Things have changed. Um, it's spreading significantly. It's uh, found in all directions. It's uh, found at higher elevations. It's uh, moving along roadways. And uh, you can even find it out in remote places. You know, you're just walking around in the sagebrush. All of a sudden, you look down and there's cheatgrass. So it has its way of getting all over the place. And Gunnison itself, the city limits, uh, tend to serve as a source and all these vectors of people moving out into the public lands and on private lands are spreading cheatgrass around. Um, lots of different vectors and uh, it's gaining momentum and unfortunately I think right now if we really are honest and look at this situation we're losing the battle. Cheatgrass is winning and we, uh, we have a scale issue that cheatgrass is invading at a rate that we're not able to, at least at this point we're not controlling it at the rate that it's spreading. So um, just real quick, I don't know what, how much time I have, but uh, I'm going to go through this slide super quick. This could be like a whole semester class, this slide, but uh, cheatgrass is such an amazing invading plant. I mean, as much as uh, you might hate cheatgrass, uh, it also deserves some respect because it's just this amazing plant that has evolved to invade and do its job well. It's not native, it's an invasive species. Um, it's a cool season annual grass. It starts growing early in the season. It has a very shallow uh, root network. It focuses not on its roots. It's not a perennial, but it focuses on producing seeds and it produces thousands of seeds per individual plant. Um, it then stores these seeds in the soil. It's this massive seed bank. It's ready to germinate, you know, every uh, sometimes fall and definitely early in the spring. Um, and then it grows very rapidly. And then it uh, matures early in the summer, and then you have all these seeds ready to go, and the plants turn brown and dry. They senesce. And then there's all this fine fuel produced, and we get into the monsoon season with lots of lightning strikes and so on, and now sage or cheatgrass can burn. And it burns all the native plants with it. And then what's interesting is it insinuates itself into this fire cycle, and then it's kind of like cheatgrass is kind of like a virus, where a virus comes into a cell overtakes the programming of the cell and then tells the cell to produce it rather than what the cell is supposed to produce. And cheatgrass gets into an ecosystem and it tells, it kind of insinuates itself into the process of the ecosystem. And as a, as a friend, Art Hayes used to always say, uh, fire, or cheatgrass begets fire and fire begets cheatgrass. It becomes this cycle. And then once that happens, this whole landscape becomes a monoculture of cheatgrass. Right? And it's really hard for the native plants to come back in because the fire cycle is so rapid. So and this is what you see. This is a slide, not in Gunnison, but of a place in the Great Basin where cheatgrass is taken over. You can see this whole landscape is covered with cheatgrass. All this blonde stuff is all cheatgrass. And here's a place where cheatgrass is burned. And it's just going to replace itself with cheatgrass. And it's going to burn. And it's going to replace itself with cheatgrass. It's a monoculture. There's none of these plants that the big game need that uh, the uh, uh, native wild um, birds and other mammals and so on need in this system. It's just totally unfunctional habitat. Um, and I don't have time to go into this slide, but basically just wanted to show that there is some organization around uh, addressing this problem of cheatgrass. And a uh, lot, this is uh, what I was referring to the GBC, the Gunnison Basin Sagebrush Ecosystem Alliance. And uh, we've tried to do a lot of different things. Um, it was a list there. This is uh, some people, um, Robin Bingham and Aaron Twiddell at a uh, event where we were pulling cheatgrass out of the town. And here's a bag of cheatgrass from the high school 
Um, there's several more bags of that, but uh, you just see there's a, there's a lot of it. But pulling cheatgrass is one approach when you have a small place and you know it's easy to do, but normally you have to take stronger measures. This is Brian Stevens from the Bureau of Land Management. We've uh, been able to create these what we call strike force days. Danny has been really involved and a leader in uh, creating those strike force days, which is a really interesting thing where we've got multiple agencies uh, the county government, the BLM, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Park Service, the Forest Service, uh, Gunnison Conservation District, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, all these different entities coming together with a single mission on a single day to, uh, to spray cheatgrass on somebody else's property. So it's not common to find the BLM working on a state wildlife area, but in Gunnison, we can do this and we do it and it's a really cool, cool thing. These slides keep changing without me touching them, but uh, this is just the, the whole point of this slide is not to read it, but just to show in 2021, there's been quite a bit of work. So we're, we're really trying to get on top of this cheatgrass. These are just all the different agencies on the left and then uh, locations and, and what they've been doing. Most of these are spraying type projects, but we're trying to get a hold of this. But when you sum up this column, which isn't complete with this column of acres, you still have something like six or seven hundred acres out of a much larger infestation of cheatgrass around around the base so hard to uh, keep up and then here's just one behind the college that we worked on with the gunnison trails organization and uh, uh, tim kugler and he had a group of uh, uh, the wccc group come in and uh, we had a bunch of people that sprayed about 13 acres using this uh, cocktail of plateau and esplanade to uh, spray that um, and then finally just to end this and I'll turn it over to Greg is this is an area that BLM was working on this summer um, and this fall it's 500 acre site out in Red Creek which is a really uh, becoming overtaken by cheatgrass um, and good stuff but we still have a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, issues to try to deal with so that we can do a better job and, and reach the scale um, one of the big things is just capacity not Amazingly, it's not so much in funding, but in all the other kinds of things where you need people on the ground. An int really interesting thing is this third one down here, herbicide applicators. There is a real dearth of herbicide applicators in the Gunnison Basin. We just can't find people to go out there and uh, it, to uh, spray cheatgrass. So if anybody's looking for a career, this is something I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and uh, other things there I won't uh, spend too much time with. I'll just end with this last thing, cross-fence cross fence approach. You have to have that with weed management because if you do everything you can to remove the weeds on your property but next door across the fence, nobody's doing anything, they're going to just come right back on. And this map is just showing the diversity of land ownership in the Gunnison Basin across this sagebrush sea. And the only way to really be effective in all the different kinds of management is to work together and to collaborate. So that cross fence, cross fence, collaborative conservation is just key to addressing these issues. So Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I have no idea how much time I just took. I hope I left you time. What we've been doing with the, the, if you didn't hear the question, it's the, if you go out and pull cheatgrass, then what do you do with it? And our normal approach has been in these sage, uh, these cheatgrass pulls is to bag it and then to um, put it in the uh, trash, right? And take it to landfill because the county works really hard around the landfill uh, to uh, deal with any spreading cheatgrass in that area. So it would be good to incinerate it, we good, but uh, most people don't have the opportunity to do that. So that was the guidance from the county weed people. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and let's, I'll address this question. I wanna make sure Greg has a chance to talk, so. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the, these different herbicides have different mechanisms and Danny might even, uh, is definitely not might, it's definitely better uh, addressing these kinds of questions. But the, the kinds of herbicides 
that we're really using for cheatgrass for the most part are very targeted just to annual grasses and they're targeted to the seeds. So what they do is they prevent the seeds from germinating and uh, uh, so it's called a pre-emergent herbicide so it uh, gets into the soil and then gets down under those seeds and prevents them from germinating. And this is kind of what uh, the, that affects the timing of when you want to do a treatment. So cheatgrass can germinate in the fall if you get enough moisture and so on. So we kind of want to do those pre-emergent treatments at the end of summer or early in fall before you see any of that fall germination. Once they germinate in the fall and you use those pre-emergents, they don't really help. So, but that's hopefully what we're trying to do is get the seed bank. Greg, why don't you go ahead and then if there's more questions. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna not use the microphone as well if that works for everyone. My name is Greg Peterson and our family ranch is east of Gunnison, east of Pardon actually. So a couple thank yous is the first thing I wanna do. First to Pat for the introduction and then the picture that I didn't know he had, so <laughs> that's okay. But I wanna thank Pat and Jessica Young for keeping this issue on the burner, so to speak. And then all the people that's done work up until now. I was one of those people that I suppose 20 or 25 years ago overlooked this issue and I was wrong. And so these folks have kept it in front of us and now I think have shown the urgency that we need to take it to the next level. And so what I'm here today to talk about is how I want to get landowners involved in this process and hopefully that we can get a large scale project in place. So Dr. Young came to the Sage Grass Strategic Committee meeting, which is a group formed that has multiple stakeholders to try to help sage grass habitat, sage grass numbers in the basin. But anyway, in August, I think, she came to that group and asked for help and as far as to put some sort of a project together that Pat's talking about a little bit here that's going to cross land boundaries and it's going to be larger scale and so that we can try to get this problem nipped in the bud, so to speak, because we do have an opportunity. And I was thankful that that happened. I'd been thinking about it a little bit. When it started to really hit me was a couple years ago, I think in 2019. And driving east of town, I started looking a little bit and you could see the cheap grass. It was something I hadn't paid attention to, but I think it was probably at a, an update they'd given at the strategic committee meeting, but I started looking, paying attention and you can see it. And, that, and folks can start looking for these some of the slides he showed, but if you're driving on the highway, you can see it'll, it'll start on the highway and then it creeps up and it gets up onto the sagebrush a little bit next to the fences on the highway right away. Then it'll jump over into the BLM lands or the private lands. And you kind of see it jumping up the hills like that. And so we have an opportunity to stop it and it's somewhat parochial for me, but the farther east we go, it's less and less and less. You can almost see where you'll see a plant right on Highway 50 and that's it. There, it hasn't made that little leap up into the highway right away or into the sagebrush on the private or BLM. So what I'm advocating for is that we need to take this opportunity and for everyone out there, if, if you're a private landowner, state lands like Pat talked about, federal lands, we're gonna try to put some sort of a project together to where we can have a broad scale, large scale collaborative project and stop this because we can in this basin so i'm lucky that pat gave a great presentation so i didn't have to work too hard as far as giving you the nuts and bolts but i am going to work hard as far as moving forward to coordinate folks to get involved and if they have questions about what it means to their private land that we can answer those questions and hopefully get everybody involved and, and make this move forward we need to look about look at possible unintended consequences we don't want to get into something where we do something that we don't want to do as far as 10 years down the road. But I think there's enough work that's been done that we can cross that bridge. And that's really it. I'm just going to be an advocate for landowners to get involved. I'm going to, I haven't met with Gunnison County Stock Growers Association yet, but I will try to get those folks on board. And we need to hire a coordinator. We need to fund this project where we can have a full-time staff member at least to put this work together because Pat has other work, Jess has other work. We need to have somebody that's just focused on this and can carry it forward and then have support help underneath. So 
I'm just here to advocate for landowners getting involved. So. Thank you, Greg. Yep. We have about, about a minute, a minute and a half for questions. Any more questions? Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Frank, this is a somewhat off topic, but in that chart you had uh, showing the safe size population over three years, mm -hmm. there were two peaks in the population followed by crashes. Are there discernible factors that lead to those population crashes rather than those, the population being sustained? Well, when you look at all the factors affecting Gunnison sage grouse, I mean, they're just this uh, amazingly, uh, in some ways, fragile species like the, like Captain Kirk's atmosphere, but they're also pretty dang robust. Like winter really isn't a huge issue for these birds. But the thing that seems to be their biggest weakness is drought. Just when it's dry, there's not food. Trying to get those young through the season uh, they need the right kind of brooder and habitat. They need the right kind of food and insects. And it's already dry in the wettest year <laughs> in here, obviously. But uh, when it gets droughty, uh, those are the years where we really see the major impact on the, on the grouse population, from my perspective. One more question. Maybe two. How, was, uh, how did cheatgrass get into Gunnison County? Is it ornamental? Or you said it kind of it, it has moved out from Gunnison, so did Gunnison, something in Gunnison bring cheatgrass to the county? I would say, you know, like it first came to North America, like in the mid 19th century. And even if you go back to uh, Aldo Leopold's famous Sand County Almanac, he has a, a chapter on cheatgrass in there. Um, but it was mostly west in the Great Basin. It came in to the west coast, probably from Iraq, or not, not just Iraq, but from the Middle East and from uh, Eurasia. And uh, I say Iraq because we had a student that went into the military, and she landed in Iraq, and the first thing she said she got out of a helicopter because there's cheek grass, <laughs> it's native. <laughs> so that's why I said Iraq. But anyway, I think it probably just kind of moved over by all these, I didn't get a chance to talk about the vectors, but there's lots of vectors, recreation, hunting, livestock, um, you name it, cheek grass, as these hitchhiker seeds that get on stuff and then they get moved. And so they're very portable and uh, eventually they just came into the base. I don't know for sure, possibly hay. Hey, yeah. All right, Greg and Pat, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.